The complement system is a part of the immune system that enhances the defense against pathogens. And there are different mechanisms that the complement system actually has that allows it to help the immune system. One of these ways is that it forms this complex on the surface of the microorganisms called the membrane attack complex, which makes holes on the membrane of the microorganisms. And these holes are gonna disturb the environment inside the cell by uh, water leaking in, causing cell lysis. So what more can I do? You know, when a macrophage is just circling around your body, the complement system acts as something called chemotaxis, where they go tell the macrophage, hey, I found a bacteria, can you come and kill it? Hence, I underline the word taxi because it actually works as a taxi for the macrophages. It tells them where to go. Other things it can do is work as opsonin. And opsonized bacteria makes it easier for phagocytes to come and actually eat them. Other factors is that the same chemotactic molecule can work as what is called anaphylatoxins, which goes to the blood vessels and uh, causing vasodilation and increase the permeability for water and proteins and cells to squeeze through. Um, other features is that we, if you add a mast cell right here, some of these molecules can cause a massive degranulation of nearby mast cells, releasing mediators like histamine, for example. Histamine also increases permeability of the capillaries and cause other things like bronchioconstriction and vasodilation. Other functions the complement system has is that it can bind and remove immune complexes off from the uh, bloodstream. So only by looking at this, you can already tell that the complement system has a lot of functions. Hopefully at the end of this video, you will see that the complement system really isn't that complicated. So nearly all the proteins for the complement system is made by the liver and released into the bloodstream. Now let's add a bacteria and see how the complement system functions. There are mainly three ways the complement system works. The first, or the classical one, can only begin once an antibody has bound to the microorganisms. And whenever you see antibodies are involved, I want you to immediately think, hey, this body has been infected with these microorganisms before, uh, because this body has antibodies against it. So this pathway of complement system doesn't really include innate or natural immune system, it includes the adaptive immune system. All right? So, um, the first complement system is C1. It looks like this. It's composed of C1Q, C1R, and C1S, so QRS. The C1Q binds to the FC region of the antibody. It only binds to IgM and IgG, keep that in mind. And after C1Q binds to the antibody, it triggers the activation of C1R, which then cleaves C1S molecule and activates it. Now what happens? C4 happens. Um, C1S is going to cleave the C4 into C4B and C4A. The C4B part binds to the microbial surface, and the A part works as anaphylatoxins and chemotaxis. I'll get more into what they do later, all right? Next, C2 comes along and is also cleaved to C2B and C2A. C4B and C2B now works at what is called C3 convertase. So when C3 comes along, it's going to cleave it into C3A and C3B. And this time though, C3B does two things. Either it binds to the microbial surface itself and works as an opsonin, so that phagocytes can come and actually phagocyte this bacteria, or it's gonna uh, bind to the surface of the C3 convertase itself and form C5 convertase. Now what happens, C5 can come, and it's gonna get cleaved into C5B and C5A, now, this is my favorite part. C5B will bind to the surface of the cell, which will bind C6, and it will bind C7, it will bind C8, and it will bind C9. So five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now what happens? Let's clean this up. As we agreed on earlier, C3B will act as an opsonin, which will help nearby phagocytes uh, with a C3B receptor to bind and actually hold onto this bacteria so that phagocytosis can happen easier. Now, I want you to remember that this process is happening all the time. C5 convertase will continue to cleave C5, which will form this complex called membrane attack complex, or MAC. And that will cause sodium and water to go in. And as they do, it will disturb the balance of the cell, causing its death. Now, I need to remind you about something. We got gram-positive bacteria, right? With a thick peptidoglycan layer on the outside. And we also got gram-negative bacteria with a lipopolysaccharide on the outside. Which of these two do you think the complement system 
can kill directly. That's correct, it's a gram negative. The reason is in the name MAC, Membrane Attack Complex. It attacks membranes and won't even be close to reach the inner membrane of the gram positive because uh, of the thick peptidoglycan layer. Usually only by making pores of the membrane of the gram negative it's enough to, to kill it because it destroys the the, environment, the inner environment of the gram negative bacteria. The gram positive bacteria however are killed kind of indirectly by the complement system with the help of phagocytosis, the C3B as you see right here. This pathway is called the classical pathway and it's one of the three ways the complement system works. So there are three mechanisms the complement system can work in. The second way is called the alternative pathway. So let's start with the bacteria again. C3 can actually undergo spontaneous cleavage in the plasma to generate C3A and C3B. Uh, C3B is then rapidly inactivated unless it binds covalently to the cell surface. Then after that, in the alternative pathway, factor B will come along and bind directly to uh, C3B. But we need to cleave it. That's where this samurai comes in, the protease, or sometimes referred to as factor D. Um, factor D is going to cleave factor D into BB and BA. Now, this binding is pretty unstable, and that's where the propylidine comes in, uh, or factor P. It binds to the C3B and BB together to form a complex. This complex is called the C3 convertase. Sound familiar? Now it can follow the same steps as before. So C3 comes along and is cleaved into C3A and C3B. Again, C3B may either sit on the surface of the microorganisms and act as an opsonin, or it can bind to C3 convertase and become C5 convertase, where C5 comes along together with C6, C7, C8, and C9, and form the membrane attack complex. Now remember, C3B that binds directly to the surface of the microorganism, this one works in opsonin, so it, it attracts um, phagocytes and promotes binding for phagocytosis. So this whole process with C3B binding, factor B and propylidine and protease. Now I want you to take a memory screenshot of this because I'm going to test you at the end of this video. <laughs> so the third and last pathway is the mannose binding lectin pathway. And this is a special one. And usually it starts one to two days after infection. Um, you know the classical pathway and the alternative pathway? They both help the macrophage phagocyte and activate. And once it activates, it's going to release some cytokines. So the active macrophage will release three cytokines called interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and tumor necrotic factor alpha. Locally, these will help cause inflammation, but they also act as what is called endogenic pyrogen. Now, don't get scared by the name if you haven't heard this before. Endogenic just means something that's produced within the body, and pyrogen is an agent that causes fever. So endogenic pyrogen causes fever. How? Um, you know the hypothalamus in the brain? It works as a temperature regulator in the body. These endogenic pyrogens will circulate in the blood and trigger the hypothalamus into releasing uh, something called prostaglandin E2, which causes fever. Now, why is fever a good thing? Um, one thing is that it makes a harsher environment for certain type of microorganisms to survive. Um, by either denaturating the proteins or slowing them down. Fever also increases the healing process in your body because it increases the temperature. Um, and many other things, fever does a lot. Now what else happens? You know the liver? Uh, interleukin-6 will travel to the liver as well and trigger the release of what is called acute phase proteins. Those include the minus binding lectin and C-reactive protein. Let's just give them faces, it makes it easier. So first, let's look at what C-reactive protein does, and then look at what mannose binding lectin do. Alright, so let's follow it. Now, chances are you most probably heard about CRP without really knowing what it does or why its level increases so much during an infection. Um, you know cells that are dying, or have already died, or even bacteria. It can actually bind directly to the surface of the cell, and it can also bind directly to the surface of bacteria and certain type of fungi as well and then it will work as opsonin so that phagocytes can bind to it, just like C3B. But what it also does though, is that, remember this guy, the C1 protein of the classical pathway? Um, C1 can actually bind to the C-reactive protein, and now the classical pathway of the complement system can, can start. I'm gonna let you do it. What comes after C1? 
c4 that's good and after c4 comes c2 that's good and these two work as c3 convertase which cleaves c3 now these three is called c5 convertase which cleaves c5 and then c6 c7 c8 and c9 binds so crp promotes phagocytosis and also activates the complement system so that's exactly why their number increases so much during an infection they help kill and opsonize bacteria and fungi and their number really increases drastically during an infection and can easily be measured in the in the blood plasma as an infection indicator because they were initially released as macrophages got activated due to the bacterial binding remember so um, that's CRP now let's look at Bandos binding lectin let's follow him you see now why the last complement pathway takes one to two days uh, to take action you need a macrophage to detect the bacteria releasing cytokines which can uh, induce fever and also trigger the liver into releasing a good phase protein so all of that has to happen in order for the mannose binding lectin to uh, take proper actions you will also find mannose binding lectin circling around your bloodstream as well it doesn't necessarily have to go through macrophages to activate the mannose binding lectin pathway but usually it starts uh, one to two days after infection all right so the mannose binding lectin has a structure that's very similar to C1Q except that it doesn't really have C1R and C1S. And remember C1Q binds, C1R activates C1S, C1S converts. But mannose binding lectin can only bind because it's only similar to C1Q. Mannose binding lectin will bind to the monosaccharide mannose which is present on the surface of capsules of microorganisms as well as certain type of fungi. And when it binds, it really cannot do anything because it lacks C1R and C1S, remember? And that is why another protein comes and help. This one is called mannane binding lectin serine protease 1, or simplified to MASP1. This one will bind to the surface of the mannose binding lectin, and this one will actually act as an enzyme. Now it can follow the same steps as the classical pathway. C4 is cleaved into C4A and C4B, um, C2 is cleaved into C2 and C2B, these two act as C3 convertase which converts C3 into binding to it forming C5 convertase or binding directly to the uh, surface of the bacteria acting as an opsonin. Um, now C5 can be converted, C6 comes along, C7, C8 and C9 and forms membrane attack complex. So that's mainly the mannose binding lectin pathway. You see that all three pathways really have the same mechanism. The only thing that's different between these three pathways are the start. All right, so now we've gone through the, all the B parts. What about the A parts? What do they do? Let's, let's look at their mechanism a little bit. C4A, C5A, and C3A are the main ones. They have two mechanisms related to inflammation. They work as an anaphylatoxins. And what does that mean? If we add the capillaries right here, these guys can cause the blood vessels to not only dilate to get more blood to the area of inflammation, but also cause the walls of the blood vessels to become leaky, to recruit more cells into the area. And at the same time, C3A and C5A can activate mast cells into releasing a lot of mediators, which can help the anaphylatoxins with their function. Now keep in mind that during allergies, we get too much histamine release and that can cause anaphylactic shock with, with bronchial constrictions and stuff. Um, another thing these guys can do is that they act as chemotaxis, meaning that if you have bacteria in the tissue and let's say monocytes in the bloodstream, these guys can actually work as a taxi for these guys, recruiting them and leading the way to, to the bacteria so that they can phagocyte them. Now, one last thing, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but if you have free-floating, let's say you have free-floating exodoxins, for example, in the bloodstream, antibodies can actually catch that and forming an immune complex. The complement system can actually come and help remove these guys. So um, that's mainly all I had for the complement system. Now, let's go over and have a little quiz. Let's test how much you remember. Um, let's start with the classical pathway. What binds first, and is it a part of your innate or adaptive immunity? That's correct, adaptive, because antibodies bind to it. And after that, what binds? 
C1, correct, which cleaves C4 into C4A and C4B. And after that binds C2, good. And C4B and C2B becomes C3 convertase, which, which converts C3B into C3B and C3A. And C3B binds either to C3B convertase or to the surface of the membrane. That's good, works at obstinate. So now C4B, C2B, and C3B works as C5 convertase, very good. And they cleave the C5 into C5B and C5A. And what sits on C5B? C6, and then C7, C8, and C9. And they work as membrane attack complex. That's very good. That was the, the classical pathway. Now, alternative pathway. Is it adaptive or innate? It's innate. That's very good. Why? Because it doesn't involve antibodies. Now, what bind first? C3B, that's good. And after that, factor B, that's good. Factor B, we need to cleave it by protease or factor D. So it cleaves it and becomes BA and BB. The binding between C3B and BB is unstable. What do they need to enhance the binding? That's good. Factor P, propidin. And this complex is called C3 convertase, which cleaves C3 into C3B and C3A. And it will either bind to the complex or to the surface itself and acts at obstinate. Now the complex we have is called C5 convertase, that's good. It converts C5, and we get the same as the classical pathway, the membrane intact complex. So that is an alternative pathway. Now the last pathway, the mannose binding lactin pathway. Is it innate or adaptive? It's innate, that's good, because it doesn't really require antibodies to get activated. It can, but it's not necessary. All right, so let's add a bacteria, an encapsulated bacteria, because remember, it binds to mannose, and mannose is kind of a sugar that exists on capsules and uh, fungi, for example. So what binds first? Mannose binding lifting, that's good. And after that, you got MASP1, that's really good. And MASP1 acts as an enzyme. So it first comes... C4 cleaves it into C4B and C4A, and then C2 into C2B and C2A. These two act as C3 convertase, which comes with C3. C3 cleaves into C3A and C3B, and C3B either binds to the surface of the bacteria, working as an obstinate, or it, it becomes a C5 convertase, after that comes C5, and then membrane attack complex happens. You see, it's not really that complicated once you get to know the, the uh, complement system. Now, just a bonus. What do these guys do? Inflammation, that's good. They work as anaphylatoxins or chemotaxic agents. That's good. So um, that was everything I had for the complement system. I hope this was a little bit helpful at least. And see you next time. Bye.